Hey, what's up? Jason here. Today, I want to talk to you about silos. I want to talk about what they are, why they can be bad for you, why they can be bad for your company, and how you can avoid them. I thought really hard about how to introduce this video because I feel like it's the kind of thing that people will hear and just click away because they're like, what, what is that? I don't know what that is, but that doesn't apply to me. But I think it applies to just about everybody who's actually in game development or really in software development. It probably applies even outside of this whole industry. You know, it's not just coders or just developers who run into these problems. So let's talk really briefly about what silos are, why they're bad, how you can avoid them and why they're bad, even if it's not you that's in them, if it's, you know, one of your coworkers who's having this problem or this behavior or this pattern of, well, a bad thing happening. Before we get started, though, make sure that you hit the thumbs up button so that this video gets into YouTube's good silo of things that it recommends and shares and that people don't make the same mistakes that I made and other people that I know have made. Also, if you don't mind uh, dropping a comment with your suggestions about this video, if you think I missed something or that there's you know, something that I said wrong or that you just totally agree with, drop a comment down below. All right, enough about uh, subscribing and hitting thumbs up. I'm sure you already did that. Let's get into the actual video. So what are silos? Well, in the, I guess, game and software industry, you could really define silos as areas of a project or sometimes at a bigger scale at a company, but we're gonna keep this down to a project or team level. So it'd be areas of a project or team where there are a set of people or maybe a single person who are the only really only people that are really involved with that thing. So nobody else is really working on whatever this one thing is. And these people are only working on that one thing. So that's kind of a vague, 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 vague example. Let's go to a specific example, though. I want to share one that happened right when I started out as a game developer. So I was on a team working on an MMO and I think the team size was around 120 or so people with maybe about 30 or 40 game designers on the team. The game designers are all segmented off to you know, work on their own little subsets. The crafting section had a couple des designers on it. So it had, like, I think three designers were on the crafting team. Um, there were designers in little groups for different areas of the world. And of course you wanna break these things up and manage them, but there was also an item system. So, you know, an MMO has a ton of items. And for the item system, the determination was made that to make things easy and to make things streamlined and consistent, instead of everybody creating items, or instead of having some you know, system for it, we had one person who would create items. And that one person was in charge of all of the items in the game. And it worked out great at first, you know? All of the items matched. There were no real weird outliers and everything was relatively consistent. But then he got a job offer somewhere else and suddenly everything kind of fell apart because if you only have one person in charge of something, the second that person leaves intentionally or unintentionally, well, things start to fall apart and you run into really big problems. And this is probably the biggest issue that you'll see with silos on your team. Now, obviously you can see why that's bad. It causes a lot of problems throughout the team. There's a whole lot of stuff that needs to be redone, systems that need to be figured out and information that needs to be transferred. And you might think, well, obviously that's a failure on the company's part. Somebody should have done that better. There should have been more than one person. And that's exactly kind of the point of this video. When you have people in silos, it means that you have people that are not really communicating across. They're not sharing stuff out and sharing things in. Or they might be, but they've got this tiny little nozzle of where the information comes in. You request some items for an area and you get back out some items. You don't really have any insight into what's going on there and nobody else does. And that might seem like a good thing if you're the item guy, you know, that you've got this silo and you're completely in charge of it. And it can be beneficial. There can be times when that just works out because you've got some huge responsibility and that responsibility adds a lot of value. But a lot of the time, most of the time, what happens with silos is that the thing that you're working on becomes less and less important. A lot of the time developers will start working on something that was mildly important and they become kind of the expert in that thing. And then all of the parts related to that just kind of get pushed off to them. For instance, let's look at like a for instance, like a crafting system in, an, in a game, right? So maybe I'm the crafting programmer and I'm getting all of the crafting requests and all I'm doing is the crafting stuff. 
I only ever work on the crafting code. I never touch the gameplay stuff or like combat stuff, item stuff, inventory stuff, anything low level, nothing with the network, nothing with the graphics. All I ever touch is crafting stuff. And you know, that can be fun and it can be exciting and I can do a lot of cool stuff with crafting. But I'm definitely not going to be growing. I'm not going to be learning more about the game. I'm not going to have a wider understanding of what's going on. And when the crafting system kind of dries up, when that system no longer becomes the thing that needs a lot of active development, my value on the team has suddenly plummeted, right? And I'm going to be, well, if programmers at game companies were likely to get laid off, which I, I guess it happens on occasion, but if that, if that were the case, you know, you're going to be up on the list of those. It's really, really one of the few things that I've seen. I, I guess I would say is I rarely ever see programmers get laid off. They're usually the last because it's just the hardest thing to train for. But if you are going to get laid off there, it's going to be because you're in some silo there where the thing that you're working on has become less valuable and you haven't really spent the time and energy learning all of the other things. And I guess that kind of leads me into how you break out of this. So say you're in this cycle of you know, being siloed in. You're working on a system kind of by yourself, or maybe it's just you and one other person, you know, a small portion of your company, and you're not really having any interaction with the rest of the company. You're not really having a big enough impact. Or, you know, maybe you feel like you're just kind of stuck doing this one thing and like all you ever get to do is this one thing. How do you bust out of that? But the answer to that is actually pretty simple. It's way simpler than you would expect, right? You just need to start volunteering for things. I mean, that's what I recommend and definitely what I've done and what I've seen work in the past. So when you're working in a silo, it can be very easy to kind of be afraid or intimidated about working on things outside of that. It's very easy to kind of get locked into, I understand this thing. All those other things are harder, confusing. I don't really get them. I don't want to mess them up. You have to get past that mentally, just kind of break through it and say, hey, I'm going to try to do these things and start volunteering for things. I would say that if you don't understand how to do the thing at all, don't volunteer to just do it on your own. Volunteer to help out. Say, hey, I don't really know how to do this yet, but I'd be happy to learn it and try to volunteer to, to help do it. Now, it's important, though, that whatever the thing you volunteer for is that you actually do it and you put in the effort to do a good job and just continue to do that. Start to volunteer for other things. Start to show up to other meetings when you can. Give a little bit of feedback. Try to give positive, constructive feedback. Don't be negative and just go in. Obviously, doing the, all the other things that I would recommend you don't do normally. Don't don't do anything bad, but go out there and just start being, I guess, a little bit more outgoing with what you'd like to do. Some of the other systems and things that you'd like to contribute to. You know, if you're the crafting designer right, and you'd like to work on combat systems, start talking to people and let them know because most of the time people are not going to know that you want to break out of your silo, that you want to start doing something else. You know, if you're the you know, gameplay coder and you want to learn networking and databases or you want to learn graphics stuff, um, start talking to people about it and let them know that you'd like to start contributing there and that you might need a little bit of direction, but you're willing to put in the work and put in the extra work to do it. Now, when I say extra work too, I just want to be clear, like sometimes like this extra work might be outside of your normal working hours and anybody that like that might freak people out and totally fine if that, that freaks you out. But if you get yourself stuck into a silo like this where you're you know, having a really hard time getting out and you don't have the time to do it during your normal hours, right? You've got all of this work in the silo and you still want to like, do some other things and expand what you're doing. You might have to actually you know, put in a little bit of extra time there, which might be unpaid. I don't know. Uh, how you do it, totally up to you. I'm just going off of what I've done in the past, which is like, if there's something that I really want to learn and I really want to expand into, I don't expect that um, I'm going to be able to just quit doing my regular work. I still have to do all that. And I'll just do the stuff like you know, when I get home or after work or at lunch or whenever I get some spare time at work. You know, if I get downtime, I dive into these other things instead of you know jumping onto Facebook or whatever other random stuff people will often waste their time with. You can just you know, start working on these other little things that you'd like to work on in your company. Start kind of understanding the systems and the way that the things work. Or really, in your game is mostly what we're talking about here. So, um, I don't know if there was much more I wanted to talk about on this. It's just kind of a a topic that has been 
an issue for a lot of people I know. A lot of people just kind of get stuck where they're they're just working on one thing and they never really get to do anything else. I mean, I, I've heard this quote I don't know, a million times from uh, Richard Campbell from .NET Rocks. And I, I don't know how to say it exactly, but it was essentially that, you know, you can have 10 years of experience as a C-sharp programmer, or in this case, a game programmer, or game developer, or you could have 10 years of, I guess, the same year of experience. If you're doing the same thing and you're stuck in this silo, and this is really why it gets so bad, you get stuck in the silo of doing the exact same thing and not growing, not learning new stuff, really getting one year of experience just kind of like, 10 times over if you're doing this same job, same thing. I've seen people do this. I've seen people get stuck like this and then their skills get outdated. They kind of get like locked in as this is the one thing that they do and they really struggle to find a new job after that position disappears or that company closes up or they just decide that they're ready to move on. So I highly recommend that if you find yourself in some silo, you know, expand out the size of the silo or break out of it you know you don't have to break out completely but expand it make it big make it encompass you know a lot more of your company and uh you know, bust out if you're if you're really stuck in there that you don't kind of end up you know on your own with yeah in a, in a bad place right I mean, that's that's really what i want to avoid here for people because i i've been in this case where i uh, stuck uh i guess i didn't even talk about that right like one of the first things let's just dive into a, a real quick example when i first started um game development the first game programming job i had was actually in the qa department so that was the first one where i had to kind of um break out of qa into some other part of development and when i was in the qa department the job was essentially to build tools for qa to automate things speed it up make it so that we could test a lot more a lot more efficiently and uh, that was a relatively short-lived job because while I was doing that and coming up with the things, as soon as I ran out of stuff to, to build, I ran out of ideas and, and tools to build and didn't have any tasks left, I started building some tools to help the designers too. Like, hey, I have all of this data. I can kind of understand how to put it together. I'll build some, uh, some of the stuff and give it to the design team too and see if it's helpful for them because I can you know, expand it out give them the ability to look at what they've changed and easily spot issues in whatever they just submitted to us before we, we even got it. So kind of sped up our process. And then I just kind of kept building them more tools, built them more and more tools that they found useful. And very shortly after that, switched roles into a tools programming job. Tools programming job kind of went the same way. I spent a lot of time just building out tools to speed things up. And kind of after you know a year or so, felt like I was kind of in this silo where I was stuck in there. All I ever did was tools. And I didn't really get to contribute very much to the actual game. So I had to, again, just start volunteering for things. I took up some tasks, looked for bugs, and started looking for other things that I could do to just help the team out that weren't tool related. And it didn't take too long. Shortly after that, I was working on all kinds of different stuff on the project. And I found that this is kind of what works really well for a lot of people, just trying out different things, volunteering for stuff, and forcing yourself out of the silo. It can be definitely a little bit daunting and I guess like a little bit hard if you're if you're not very outgoing and I'm definitely not very outgoing. I'll ignore the fact that I'm on YouTube and stuff still totally not outgoing in person or ever in the past. Um, but just start talking to people more, you know, make more friends at work and uh you know, bust out of these silos. I don't know what else to say about it other than I, I hope this is at least a little bit helpful. And I think if you have advice on this, like you've done this yourself, or maybe you're stuck in this kind of situation, you have questions about it, drop them in the comments below, because I'd be really curious to see what other people think about this. And uh, just like what other advice, you know, you guys have on how to how to resolve these problems. And if anybody's stuck in it, maybe we can just kind of talk about it and fix the issue. I don't know. Let's see how it goes. Anyway, Thanks for watching. Thanks for hitting thumbs up and subscribe and the alert button and all that. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks for letting me use a second camera over there. I have no idea if it'll be in here or not. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Um, thanks again.